Let's just uh, practice a little bit of Riemann Stoltz integral with very basic examples. So we have uh, three increasing functions: alpha, beta, and uh, what do you call this thing? Gamma. I want to say ion in Hebrew, right? So yeah, so you have those uh, those those, those uh, increasing functions. So a. What we want to know is. Um, What is the condition on a function that belongs to the bounded space on the interval from minus 1 to 1? So the function is bounded such that the function is integrable with respect to alpha. And of course, find the integral. So how do we do that? Now notice that uh, alpha is pretty much a flat uh, function, so that there is no not much change, so what we can do is we can let uh, a partition of minus 1 to, to 1 be given by the points minus 1, let's write them like this, minus 1, less than x1, x1 is less than 0, 0 is less than some x2, and x2 is less than 1. So then, what can we say about u of f p, we are using Riemann uh, condition, minus l of f p. What's the difference between the upper sum and the lower sum over this partition? Zero. No, it's not 0. It is not 1 either. Uh, so notice, uh, so notice what, what's happening here. So between minus 1 and x1, alpha of x1 minus alpha of minus 1 is 0, right? So uh, over this the rectangle, over this region, the rectangle uh, whose base is alpha and whose height is f will have 0 area, correct? Over here? The rectangle will also have zero area. We are just generalizing Riemann integral. So instead of considering 1 minus x2, we consider alpha 1 minus alpha x2. Right? But alpha 1 minus alpha x2 will make uh, this difference zero. So the integral vanishes, the sum vanishes here, it vanishes here, and the only thing that survives is the supremum of this function over the interval from. Notice between x1 and 0, for alpha, between x1 and 0, it's, it stays flat here as well, right? So the only thing that survives is m from 0 to x2 minus little m from 0 to x2 times alpha x2 minus alpha of 0, which is simply m0 x2 minus little m0 x2. Well, if it's integrable, it has to go to 0, right? So this goes to, this should go, I should say, should go. As x2 goes to 0 plus 
otherwise not integrable. So alpha x2 minus alpha 0 is 1? Yes, it is 1. Is that defined on the graph? It's defined on the graph. Oh. x2 is here, it's 1, oh. 0, uh, it's 0. Right? Can you, can you explain for a second? You define alpha equals yes. is that, is that an x? What is that? Yeah. What is what? X subscribe like Psi. This is the characteristic function. So it is uh, one only on the interval from zero to one. Oh, that was And I just drew it. Right? So there is a definition of what it is, and I drew it. So otherwise f is not integrable. So alpha is half closed, but beta is uh, closed. Yeah, beta is uh, closed, right? Otherwise, f is not integrable. So this implies, I, I hope you are seeing this, right? I, I don't want to say too much, right? If I make any refinement of this partition, it's going to reduce to this case. Right? You're really going to uh, end up looking at the points immediately below 0 and points immediately after 0. So any other refinement of this partition will not really uh, do anything to it, right? This partition is just really controlled by moving x1 closer to 0 and x2 closer to 0. In fact, actually, all of the left-hand side is not important for alpha. It's just going to be wiped out to 0. Right? So in other words, uh, we have f belongs to r of alpha from minus 1 to 1, if and only if f 0 plus is equal to f of 0. That is, if and only if f is right continuous. So you understand this example, right? It's not, uh, what you do is you construct a Riemann sum, but instead of using delta x, you're using delta alpha. Now, alpha of x1 minus alpha of minus 1 is 0. Alpha of 0 minus alpha of x1 is 0. So rectangles constructed here and here vanish. They are 0. Uh, the rectangle constructed uh, between x2 and 1 is also uh, vanishing. Its base is vanishing. Alpha controls the base. So the only thing that survives is 0 to x2. Any refinement of this partition reduces to this case. Why um, from 1 to x2 does it vanish? Is it because they both equal to 1? Uh, from 1 to x2, the alpha of 1 and alpha of x2 both equals 1. The difference is 0. Right? So in other words, if I take x2, no matter where I take x2 here, 1 and x2, the difference is 0. The difference is 0. So f is right, continue. So then what's the integral? What's the integral from minus 1 to 1 of f d alpha? Can you see what it is? No, it's not 1. f is not necessarily 1. No. From 0 to x2. Yes, it is. I mean, I can eliminate minus 1. If you mean reduce the integral to be from 0 to 1, sure, but I want the answer calculated. So it would just be x2? No. x2 is, uh, is a place in the partition, right? Sorry? Think about what happens to the partition. No, it's not 0. What happens to the partition, right? So you, you said x2 in a way that's right, but when I refine the partition, what happens is that this x2 that I refer to is just a point really close to 0. So f0. Wonderful. This is f of 0. So this is equal to? But f of 0 doesn't exist. <laughs> no, I mean, no, f of 0. Well, you're looking alpha of 0. First of all, it does exist alpha of 0. And, first, and secondly, f of 0 is defined. It's about the function at 0. I thought there was two holes. You, OK, so this is alpha. Right? This hole is filled. So alpha of oh, 0 is 0. Uh, alpha of 0 is 0, yes. Uh, no, it's f of 0. So this is equal to. f of 0. So do you see why? Yeah. Do you see why, right? What's happening is I can take, I can take the upper sum. Upper sum is going to be the maximum, right? Or the supremum here. Now x2 is going to be pushed closer to 0. x2 is going to be pushed closer to 0. That will make this guy f of 0. Okay? 
So this is f of 0. So example b. Now do the same. For F belonging to integral with respect to beta. Okay? So and under what condition is f in uh, r of beta? That's a continuous. You see that. Wonderful, <laughs> right? Left continuous. Guess. You just guessed? <laughs> well, good guess, right? So uh, what you do is, again, you can just pick any part. You can pick the partition. Let P be the partition minus 1, less than x1, less than 0, less than x2, less than 1. So again, I'm, I'm saying a few things that I'm not writing. You understand that any partition that, uh, that refines the one I'm giving is going to give you the same results, really, right? So I, by understanding what happens on this partition, I understand what happens to the integral. So then I have that u of f of p minus l f of p is equal to what survives in this case? Between x1 and 0. Yes, between uh, x1 and 0. Wonderful, you see that. Right? Uh, between x1 and 0, the jump is, uh, is 1. And between uh, x2 and 0, there is no jump. So that simply is uh, m, big M, which is the supremum, which is from x1 to 0, minus little m, x1 to 0, times alpha, alpha of 0 minus alpha of x1. And that means that f belongs to our beta minus 1, 1, if and only if it's left continuous. So uh, in that case, what's the integral from minus 1 to 1 of f d beta? Still f of 0. Still f of zero. In this case, just approximated from the left. right? So you, if you take any right or left partition, it's just going to be an approximation from the left of f of 0. That's how you evaluate it. Just take uh, a left Riemann sum, so a, a L, or Riemann sum of P, or U, and you will see an approximation from the left. Okay? Finally, C. Do the same. for f in the space of integral function, integrable functions with respect to gamma. So again, uh, in using this partition, P as before. What can you tell me about UFP minus LFP? Calculate it, tell me what it is. 
x1, x2, uh, be careful about 0. Notice there is a 0 here, right? Oh. So how do we include it? You split it up into two, precisely, right? So there are two things that survive. From x2, it survives because there is a jump of 1 half. And from x1, it survives, there is a jump of 1 half. So what should that be? That should be. Right, so uh, let's, let's write it. So that would be big M uh, x1 to 0 minus little m x1 to 0 times alpha of 0 minus alpha of x1 plus big M 0 to x2 <coughs> minus little m 0 to x2 alpha of x2 minus alpha of 0. And what do we get? This is simply what's uh, alpha of 0 minus alpha of x1? No, it's not quite beta, no. It's 1 half, exactly. So in both cases, it's 1 half. So I can factor out 1 half. So this is 1 half times mx10 minus little m x10 plus big m 0x2 minus little m 0x2. So what's the conclusion? Looking at this Riemann sum, what can you conclude must happen for this, uh, for this function f to be <coughs> if and only if what? So again, uh, just like with calc 1, what you're doing is uh, you're building a bunch of rectangles. And let's say x1 is the closest one to 0, the closest one to 0 that you have in your partition. x2 is the closest one to 0 from the right. Everything else vanishes, right? So what should happen? The, this difference, uh, u minus l, should vanish to 0. That's Riemann criterion, Riemann condition. So what should happen? Which means? Which means? <laughs> it's what? That the supremum of that left side and then the infernal on the right side uh, subtract where they're equal. So this quantity, could it ever be negative? The quantity that I'm pointing to? No. 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 This, could it ever be negative? No, yet, the, yet, yet this thing has to be crushed to 0. You agree? For, uh, basically, as I refine my partition P, what happens in practice is that x1 inches its way closer to 0 from the left, x2 inches its way closer to 0 from the right. Do you see that? So it's continuous at 0. So it's continuous at 0. Right. Do you see that, right? Just pick a Riemann sum. Uh, you see, I, I, just, uh, I just pick this partition, but really what you do in practice, pick any partition. x1 is the closest to 0 from the left. x2 is the closest to 0 from the right. 
uh, all the rectangles over other segments vanish to zero because alpha of uh, anything below x1 minus, uh, th 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 you know, uh, anything below x1 will be zero because of, uh, sorry, because of omega, because of gamma, and same thing, uh, if everything above x2 will be zero because of gamma, right? So if and only if limit as x goes to zero of f of x is f of zero. What is the integral? That's good. Exactly. Will equal to f of zero. Why? I mean, what you do is take the upper sum. Let's say the upper sum is just uh, one half of this maximum and this maximum. Now, when I push x one close to zero, I get really f of zero, and here I get f of zero. So I get f of 0 plus f of 0 times 1 half, which is again f of 0. Okay? All right. So then, a very easy consequence that you already knew about, but the relationship between the space of bounded variation and Riemann integrability. Why do we have alpha, beta, and gamma? Sorry? Why, why do we have alpha, beta, and gamma? I don't know. It's a Greek alphabet. Oh, okay. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, I mean, like, it, 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 is any special, like, why we partition this this way? And from 0 to 1, blah, blah. I know, those are just easy examples, really, right? Uh, usually, what do you do when you use Riemann, Riemann integrability? Your, your alpha is what? If I drew the graph for, for your regular Riemann integral, what should have been your alpha? Delta x. No. Step function. No, that's step function. You, your regular Riemann integral, what, what, what would have been a picture for your alpha? A straight line. A straight line? What straight line? A constant line. If it's a constant line, what's integral over a constant line? Zero. No? So it's Line through the origin, what's the slope? Y. Y equals x. Y equals x is your usual um, increasing function. That's when it's Riemann integrable, right? So the idea is uh, what happens is if you have, uh, whenever you have flatness, right? This flatness, uh, over this flatness, every function is integrable. This flatness is going to, the, the rectangles you construct are going to dest destroy the function. Right? Whatever height you have for f, delta, or so to speak, delta alpha is going to be zero. Right? So really, the reason you, you could see that, you see that this, this, there is a, only a jump, only, only some sort of increasing behavior only at zero. That's really why f of zero is the only thing that matters. So that's kind of the length of Rectangle. Yes, pretty much that's what happens, right? The, 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 whatever you, you, you build, uh, you build this function, you construct rectangles, but you, for their base you use alpha, right? So you use delta alpha, which is alpha of xk minus alpha xk minus one. So that in practice, what does it do? It tells you that the only the, the, the only width we have is is really the, the, this constant width, which is at zero, right? Which is one, and uh, and the function is becoming their f of zero. What previous method? This is a gener This is. Uh, like I don't. So. <coughs> I mean, what what you do you usually, you might see things like that sometimes in physics. So you might have integral from a to b, of, let's say. X, times, d x, cubed. 
for example. Okay. So what that what might might it mean? It it might mean that uh, what you're doing is uh, you're integrating. Oh, what this integral will end up uh, will end up being is simply you can reduce it because it's a differentiable function that will reduce to something like uh, a b x times three x squared d x. Right, so it would it would reduce to uh, to a regular uh, Riemann integral, but in this case the function is uh, differentiable. Right, so uh, you you do things like that when you consider uh, when you consider uh, when you consider uh, what do you call it weights. Essentially, I mean, it's it's more readily understood why it's useful in uh, in higher dimensions. So, for example, you have this curve. So you have this curve omega, and what you want to do is you want to uh, con you want to find the total work done by some force. So at each point here, there is a force corresponding to uh, to this point. Okay, so uh, basically, how do you break up the integral? If you consider this integral, what you do is you take this would be delta alpha, right? So it, usually, it's not just changing in uh, uh, not just changing in one dimension, but it's changing its uh, in, in directions in several dimensions, right? So you can understand this integral. Pretty much like you understood all others, right? So you consider um, you consider an integral of the form f. Let's say this curve is it's called this curve, yeah. See, so you consider f of c, and you consider here d uh, d gamma, something like that, right? Um, have I answered by any chance your question or not at all, or what? <laughs> not really. No. Not really. So gamma is changing? Is it because it cancels out? Like, I, no, I mean, Riemann Sturch's integral, what is that? So it's re like your regular um, integral, except that you, what you do is you generalize, uh, you generalize what's, what's your delta x could be. Right? So in... In general, if you if you are considering so any complex uh, any complex in any complex analysis function, uh, you have functions of the form f of z dz. Dz is your uh, is your is, is something that is just changing like what I drew in this picture. It's two it's two dimensional. So that's where um, that's where it's more useful, I suppose. That's where you really see that uh, you need you need a definition of this so of what this uh, thing is, which is very similar to again just very similar to a Riemann definition. It's just something like this. Delta ZK, okay? So for this, uh, for, uh, now, now if you are integrating, you need, you need to select a curve. So you can, uh, you can select a differentiable curve, or you can select a curve that is, uh, that is actually only piecewise differentiable, or a curve that is actually very terrible. So it's like very, uh, maybe of bounded variation, for example, right? 
that's where you uh, where you use this. Is it useful in one dimension? I don't know. Maybe I have I haven't used it in one dimension at all. Right. So, bounded variation and Riemann integrability. Theorem. Suppose F prime exists and is Riemann integrable. on a b then f belongs to the space of bounded variations on a b and the total variation is the integral from a b F prime t dt. And this is true in uh, the multivariable uh, case, right? So this is just your uh, arc length. Proof. Given any partition p, Of AB, we have that the variation of F over P is simply the summation And this reduces uh, to the mean value theorem. apply the mean value theorem. Uh, that's what we. Uh, that's what we assume. We, we assume that the function f prime exists. Okay. Right. Right. So, so again, I mean, uh, you might still be having this question. I mean, you're learning this uh, thing about uh, bounded variation and about Riemann-Schuchat's integral. Uh, is there an enormous benefit? Uh, I mean, I even even in uh, you see, usually in complex analysis, you take very simple curves where some things are a bit more obvious, right? So I suppose maybe there is, right? But uh, but I personally have not had the opportunity to see it. Right? There are a lot of, I, don't know, I mean, what's what's more important is the Lebesgue integral that uh, that, that is used more often. I've seen, right? And that's measured here and whatnot. Are we gonna talk about it? Lebesgue integral? No, no. And you are usually talking about it in uh, analysis three. So that's devoted fully to the Lebesgue integral. But I can tell you which which books are good for that, right? Yeah. Is that just the norm you're taking? Sorry? Is that the absolute value? The norm of 
uh, this is not the norm, right? No, uh, no. Yeah, what? The summation. The summation. Uh, it's just absolute value. Yeah. You can you can do that in you can actually generalize this for R two or R three, which is what you need for complex analysis, right? And that will be still true, right? So there there are some books that begin. Let's say uh, if you take Conway, it begins uh, the uh, integ uh, chapter on integration of complex functions with uh, the Riemann Stieltjes integral and with functions of bounded variation, but moves much faster than we do, in fact, right? Uh, and that's again because you, you sometimes have very crazy curves and uh, yeah I, I think mostly you have curves that are that are so crazy that, that they're not even of bounded variation but uh, if you want to say what what, what are the um, what, what are some curves over which this integral works so those would be any so C in some books they would just say it's just a smooth curve in which case you can just calculate its arc length and you never bother, right? Smooth curves are good for most purposes. Some say, well, they don't have to be smooth, they have to be piecewise smooth, right? So it's a little bit better, but piecewise smooth and smooth are almost the same. And then you can say uh, this curve C has to be of bounded variation, right? And if it's a bounded variation, then uh, if it, it's a difference of two increasing functions or so. So at least if it's a bound variation can be reduced to studying uh, bounded variation in, in one dimension, right? The function is of bounded variation in any dimension if its component functions are of bounded variation in one dimension. And then you have that stuff. Okay? So to characterize what are the functions of bounded variations. Those are the functions that if you look at their co components, x1, x2, x3, x1 is a difference of two increasing functions, x2 is a difference of two increasing functions, etc. So that's the characterization of functions of bounded variation. Right? Makes sense, right? <laughs> All right. All right, so we have this. And uh, the implication is that we have that the uh, lower sums are less than or equal to the variation over P, which is equal to the upper sums for the derivative function. So by refining P, That's uh, true if the function is differentiable, right? We just have this, you see, we, we take any variation, we reduce it to a particular uh, sum, like a, a particular Riemann sum. This tk is just some place uh, between xk minus 1 and xk. So then if I, uh, if I just uh, always just, I, I just change the tk so that they correspond to the supremum, I just move them around so that they correspond more and more to the supremum, this is bigger than, the, uh, than this variation we calculated over p. And uh, on the other hand, I can decrease the sums, right? So by refining p, by refining p, we see that Right, so this thing, I can just take the lower sums, subtract epsilon over 2, and we have this relationship. And I can take the upper sums and add epsilon over 2, and I have this relationship. Since epsilon is arbitrary, It follows that, you see, for this uh, variation, uh, so for any, uh, for any P, this is, we have this uh, situation. It follows that positive, epsilon. epsilon is positive, yes. F <coughs> belongs to the uh, space of bounded variations over AB. 
and that the variation of f is indeed the integral from a to b of the derivative. So you see why it follows that it's a bounded variation. So no matter what's the p, you see we just pick of any p, we then have this estimate. Now this uh, now if p is uh, very fine, then we have this estimate. We replace it by those, this constant estimate. So that now tells us that for this p or any finer p, the variation is not going to increase to infinity. Therefore, the function is of bounded variation. Now, it also is, is like a squeeze theorem. You see, it forces the variation to be squeezed to the integral of the derivative. All right. Finer p just means um, means more points. So. Notice that Riemann's condition can be phrased as follows. So we know that f belongs to the space of integrable functions over a b if and only if for each n. There is um, partition Pn such that if I take u the upper sums at Pn subtract the lower sums at Pn I will get less than 1 over n Right? Any refinement of this partition will just, uh, you see, if I refine Pn, in other words, put more points, the upper sums will only decrease and the lower sums will only grow, so the difference will still remain to be 1 over n. So this is like a sequential uh, description of uh, this condition. And uh, the other thing is uh, the Riemann condition also allows us to test which functions are not, uh, are not riemann stuches integrable. test to determine when uh, given f in the space of bounded functions is not Riemann, is not Riemann which is integrable. So what you have is let let 
P be just any partition of the form x0 all the way to xm. Then what we have is u f at p minus l at p. This is simply the sum where k goes from 1 to m of the supremum uh, over the interval xk minus 1 to xk minus the infimum over the same interval times alpha of xk minus alpha of xk minus 1. Right? This is just like a Riemann integral, but uh, we're using this alpha for delta. Now, what is this? This is the same as the oscillation, right? It's the difference between the maximum value f can be and the minimum value it can be. This is the oscillation of, well, with respect to f over the interval xk minus 1, xk. Now, since alpha is increasing, alpha is increasing. This is the maximum or supremum. This is the minimum, right? Uh, this is like the oscillation of alpha. Or this is more like the oscillation of alpha over the same interval. Now, this entire sum is bigger than or equal to just simply the oscillation of f at some point x times oscillation of alpha at the same point x. And here we have x is in the interval, well, even in the open interval, let's say, xk minus 1 to xk. So what happens is the conclusion is that if both functions fail to be, uh, to be continuous at, some, at some, the same x, if they both fail to be continuous on the same x, then they uh, in, then the function is not Riemann integrable with respect to alpha. Sorry, can you just say why? How do you get rid of summation? I, I just ignore it, right? Summation might only, uh, summation is always adding positive terms. Do you agree? Because I'm always adding supremum minus infimum, so I'm all, only adding positive terms. So if I just uh, find that, that somewhere in this partition at this point x, both f and alpha are not continuous. If they are both not continuous, then their oscillations at x and at, uh, their both oscillations at x are positive. And therefore, the product of the oscillation is positive. And therefore, uh, the upper sum minus the lower sum will never be getting smaller than this oscillation. Okay? So, conclusion. If f and alpha share a point of discontinuity, in other words, the discontinuities of f intersection the discontinuities of alpha is not empty, then f is not riemann stilchus integrable with respect to alpha. Can you give an example? 
An example of that? Well, yeah, sure. Example, so uh, let's let alpha be, well, let's see. Alpha be given by this graph. So let's say this is one half, this is one. And what we have is we have an alpha that is like this. This is uh, alpha, okay? Just a sub picture of it. So f of x is, I can just draw a graph for it. So let's say it's something like this. And like this. So parabola and uh, something like this maybe, right? Where this point is one half, okay? So because they share a common discontinuity at this one half and at, uh, at this point, it's a common discontinuity, f is not Riemann integrable with respect to alpha. Okay, so just draw, draw any, basically with whatever curve you, you draw, if it, there is a discontinuity at alpha, there must be a continuity on the corresponding point for f. Okay? So if a partition was one half, the oscillation of alpha would be that, so the oscillation for that first part would be the height of that slope? Uh, the oscillation uh, for, for, for alpha, for, the, for one half, it's, well, I didn't really mark it, but it's whatever is uh, this distance. Right? That's the oscillation for alpha at one half. It's, so it's just this distance. Exactly the distance from this point to that point. And the oscillation for f is exactly the distance between this point and that point. Right? So what you have is the product of those two oscillations is the product of those two positive numbers. It's, it's, it's bigger than zero, therefore the uh, upper sum minus the lower sum will not merge to zero. What about the oscillation at uh, Well, what would, happen, what would happen here? You can in fact try to calculate, if you want to try to draw this picture and, or even give, uh, give yourself more uh, concrete examples, you can try to calculate what happens to the integral from minus one to zero. So from minus one to zero, it will be uh, Riemann integrable, you agree? Mm -hmm. It will be Riemann integrable from minus one to zero, and uh, what's gonna be uh, the, in the integral, everything is gonna vanish except to, uh, for this, this thing at minus one half. So it's gonna be this distance multiplied by the value of this function at, mi at one half, right? So if distance, so you understand what I'm saying, right? I don't want to, right? So it's gonna be this distance times f of minus one half. That would be the integral if I just integrate from minus one to zero. So the oscillation doesn't depend on the partition? The oscillation, that's a very, that's a, that's a very good question because then uh, you might include those points in, in the partition, but then, uh, but then the, the, yes, you might include those points in the, in the partition. I would say if the function is Part of the oscillation, if the function is discontinuous, either from the left or the right will survive. If you include x as, the, as, as, um, as basically, so the oscillation might be decreased by that. If you include 
x as one of the points in the partition, but if the function is not continuous, either the left part of the oscillation or right part of the oscillation will survive. Right, will be non-zero. You can remedy this thing, in other words. What you're, you're thinking is, is, I mean, you might have left continuous, right continuous, they cancel each other out in a way. Right? So if you have a combination of uh, alpha is left continuous, but not right continuous, and uh, f is vice, vice versa, then uh, they can cancel each other out, the oscillation. So if, uh, that's if that's a function, half would be bounded in order to be in Well, uh, for, for, for this definition, yes. Otherwise, it's an improper integral. You notice that we're using upper sum minus lower sum. So for uh, this to be, the, you remember you considered improper integrals. So improper integrals were integrals where uh, the interval was not bounded or the function was not bounded, right? So you drop this, if you, if you study the Lebesgue integral, you don't need this assumption. And the Lebesgue integral always gives you the same results as the Riemann integral whenever, whenever Riemann integral can apply. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you see that, right? I think, did we show last time that the continuous functions are always integrable with respect to alpha? Did we show that? I think we have. So the space of integrable functions. Uh, yes, I think you said a continuous function from A, B is always running. Right. But is this for any increase in alpha? Yeah, for now for any increase in alpha. Theorem, let f and g be in r alpha of a b and c be a real number. <coughs> then We know that any constant times f is also Riemann Stieltjes integrable. And the integral works as you expect. Two f plus g is also going to be Riemann integrable if f and g are. And Third property, the integral from a to b of f t alpha is less than or equal to the integral from a b of g d alpha whenever f is less than or equal to g. The absolute value of f 
is Riemann integrable with respect to alpha and the absolute value of the integral is less than the integral of the absolute value which is the big, which uh, this function is uh, in the space of bounded function so this is less than the sup norm of f times alpha of b minus alpha of a and 5 the product of f and g will always be again Riemann integrable Pretty much future is integrable, and there is a Cauchy Schwartz. That would be All right, so there are they, those, everything here is very elegantly proved in your book. I have five minutes. If you want to, I can prove one of those, if anything is interesting, right? Last one. Otherwise, otherwise, uh, last one? The first one. <laughs> right, uh, otherwise, otherwise, uh, you can just, uh, you know, you can just study it at home. Last one? Uh, no, I mean, for the last one, can you just apply the vectors? No, we don't know yet. It's a vector space. So, uh, so first we uh, and we don't know what's 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 the norm. What's the norm on it, right? So first of all, you establish one through uh, through three. Well, actually, one through two establishes it's a vector space. You don't yet know what its norm. Okay, that's true. Yeah. Number four. Number four? Yeah, by the way, the most annoying, in my opinion, is number one, right? Because, the, you see, when you're factoring, the constant can be negative, honestly, right? So the others are, uh, are all right. And it's in the book, very elegant. I think last uh, class I showed you uh, roughly what to do with number two. Uh, Carothers does it a little better, actually, I think, right? So, yeah. So you want number four? One. <laughs> one? What, do I, what should I do? Quickly, Whatever. four minutes. I, don't know. I prefer four, but. All right, four. <laughs> I can get it afterwards. It's in the book again. But my advice is just try to prove it on your own, right? See if you can do it on your own, and then, right. So, four. So, uh, first of all, uh, triangle inequality. implies that if I take absolute value of f of x minus, so absolute value of f of y, and know it in absolute value, this is less than or equal than f of x minus f of y. From there, it very easily follows, a little unpleasant to write, that if I take for any partition u of absolute value of f at p minus l of absolute value of f <coughs> at p. Can you see that? That this will be less than or equal than u f of p minus l f of p. You see how I use the triangle inequality? It's when I measure the maximum, so the supremum of absolute value f minus the infimum absolute value of f, that's less than just uh, measuring the difference between them. Because you see, one of them is the infimum of this, so it's this minus that. That's really what's happening, right? If you forget about supremum and infimum, think of it as just happening at a point. So if the supremum happens at the point x, so we have absolute value f of x minus absolute value of f of y 
And that's less than f of x minus f of y. So that's why this is happening. Okay. It's, it, you, can, you, can, you can write it out. It's just a bit, uh, it's a nuisance. So the, the implication is that if f is integrable, then the absolute value is also there. <coughs> Now, uh, what's, what's, what's going to be the relationship? Uh, now we have by, by 3, since I didn't prove 3, but by 3. We know that absolute value of f is bigger than or equal to the maximum of minus f and f. And the implication is that the integral from a, b of f d alpha, absolute value of f d alpha, is going to be bigger than the integral from a, b of both f d alpha, and bigger than the integral from a, b minus f d alpha. And minus f d alpha is just simply minus integral a, b f d alpha by 1 which is the not most, in my opinion, most unpleasant thing to prove is factoring a negative out of the integral, OK? So we have this. And the consequence is, look at it. This, this is a number. This number is bigger than, than this number, and it's negative. So the implication, then, is that the integral from a, b, absolute value of f, the alpha, is bigger than or equal to the absolute value from a to b f d alpha. Right? Now, on the other hand, if I take absolute value of f, this is clearly less than the constant function, which is the supremum, supnorm of f. Right? So the consequence is that the integral from a, b of absolute value of f, the alpha, is less than or equal to the integral from a, b of the subnorm, the alpha. Now, subnorm is just really, when you, when you write a Riemann sum for this, what do you see? You just see that it's telescoping, and it's just going to be norm of f times alpha of b minus alpha of a. And it's done. Okay, mm -hmm. so again, right? The the most unpleasant, I think, uh, is number one. Others are, uh, are better, and uh, the most interesting is maybe number five. All right, but try to see if you can come up with. Just try to see if you can do one, two, three on your own. Maybe with five, you will you, you might want to consult the book. Maybe. Okay. All right, so uh, see you next class. I think I, I, I'll just let it be, and I'll, I'll just move on, right? I'm not going to cover this.